about himself, he said recently, as for a message, well, I have no message. Right. Some, things, no message some things simply occur to me, and I write them down with no aim to hurt anyone or to convert anyone. This is all I can say. I make this public confession of my poverty before everybody. Besides, yeah. had I not done so, you would, have known, me, no? you would have known it was true. Yes, that's what I said. Yes, yes. I'm just going to finish this introduction, and then we'll that's exchange. Right, yes, right. Uh, about, him, others, about him, others have written that he is the greatest living writer, still others that he has influenced the literature of the world more than anyone alive. Jorge Luis Borges lives here in Buenos Aires, although he has traveled extensively, especially in the United States, and taught most recently at Harvard for a year. He is blind since the late 50s. He does not mind it, he says, because now he can live his dreams with less distraction. He took early to his craft, translating into Spanish from the English Oscar Wilde's The Happy Prince when he was six years old. The translation, thought to have been the work of his father, was used as a school text. He began to publish in the 20s poems, essays, short works of fiction. <clears throat> in the late 30s, he got his first job as a menial assistant in a library, but even this he lost for the offense of having signed a declaration in opposition to General Perón in 1946. When Perón was ousted, Mr. Borges was made director of the National Library, right. and his literary work continuing at an extraordinary rate, and including now translations into Spanish of major American writers. He took to lecturing widely, acquainting many Americans with his writings and with himself. Concerning his work, his critics disagree, except on the proposition that it will survive the century. Mr. Borges is substantially but not entirely apolitical. Since Argentina is having its problems, I thought to begin by asking, is there anything, Mr. Borges, distinctively Argentinian about those problems? Well, I wonder. I know very little about politics. But I think we have the right government now. Government of gentlemen, not of hoodlums. I don't think we're right for, for the democracy as yet, maybe in a hundred years or so. But now I think we have the right government. I think that the government means well, and the government is acting. And, as I said, we are going by gentlemen and not by the scum of the earth. This happened, well, quite a short time ago. When you say that it might be a hundred years before... Well, or let's say 500, no. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, go with that. After our time. Yes. If, uh, why, why is that? Is it something distinctive to uh, Argentinians, distinctive to the hemisphere, distinctive to what? I can't tell you since I, own, since I know my own country and I'm very puzzled by my country. I wish I understood my country. I can only love it. I can do what I can for it, but I don't pretend to understand it. I'm no historian. <laughs> well, when you say that you don't understand it, do you mean that you are continually surprised by what happens? Yes, I am continually surprised, but I try to live in my own private, included in my own private, the literary world. Well, do you recognize an obligation of the man of letters to involve himself in politics to the extent of saying no to the barbarians? Yes. To that extent, I do. Not more than that. I think that if I do my literary work honestly, then, in a sense, I am doing something for my country. And if I can do nothing else, being old, blind, and lonely, I, well, I, I to try to do my, my to work as best as, 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 it, as it well as I can. That's all I can do. I have never involved myself in politics. I have never allowed myself to be bribed. I haven't even tried to be famous. So I have become quite famous, but, but I have done nothing whatever to it in that sense. I have merely kept on writing, never thinking of the, of, of the public or of the readers. I write to please myself. I mean, if I were Robinson Crusoe in my desert island, I would go on writing. Yeah. And I suppose I would write more or less the same kind of stuff I'm turning out now. Well, you were, you were criticized, uh, to be sure, in a, in a left journal in America for, for instance, advocating the 
execution of Regis Debray in Bolivia. Is that correct? Yes, I suppose it's correct. But after all, I think execution, I think that capital punishment is kinder than, than, than it, the, it a prison. I'm not against capital punishment. I, I, I wouldn't mind being executed, but I wouldn't like spending five years in jail. Um, Personally, I wouldn't mind being executed. <laughs> In fact, I think I would welcome it, since I'm rather tired of life, since life has few pleasures left <laughs> to me. Well, if you insist on being executed, uh, let, me know, <laughs> let, let me know and I'll suggest a provocation. Yeah, you, you think of, of the Gilmore. <laughs> no. Well, why not? <laughs> Maybe you're right. Well, he wasn't being sentimental about himself or feeling sorry for himself. <laughs> or abounding, a skipling headed in loud self-pity. I don't think a man should abound in loud self-pity. Eh? At least I have tried my best to not to do so. Well, do you find, do you find this, uh, this challenge, this, this inclination to self-pity, uh, uh, a I, characteristic I, of the age? I wonder if a characteristic of the age. I know very little about the age. But maybe it is rather common here in this country. People go in for being sorry for themselves, which is a pity, I think. Because, of course, if you go in for being sorry for yourself, then you, well, you keep on being sadder and sadder, no? You mean because there's so much to be sorry for? Oh, yes. <laughs> but sometimes, walking down the street, I sometimes feel unaccountably happy, and then I welcome that happiness. Because I don't know where that happiness comes from, but still, it should be welcomed. I think happiness should always be welcomed. Is it a happiness that comes as a result of the satisfaction you take in your work? No, personally, I dislike my work. I prefer the work of any other writer. <laughs> I think that every time I have not been given the Nobel Prize, I think that the Swedish Academy has acted justly. I don't deserve that prize. When I think that well, you, that you certainly don't deserve to be put in the same class with Quasimodo. But I don't deserve to be put in the same class as Kipling or Faulkner or Bernard Shaw. <laughs> well, they can't miss all the time. No. <laughs> well, uh, uh, you, you mean you have officially abandoned uh, any intention of receiving the Nobel Prize? No. I think it's a kind of game that is played every year. No, every year I am really given the Nobel Prize, and then, it's, then it turns out the next year. It's a kind of habit I have, or a kind of habit that the, 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 the Scandinavians have. In fact, you might recall an old Norse tradition, no, not to give me the Nobel Prize. No? <laughs> <laughs> That's a part of Norse mythology, and I'm very fond of Norse. Well, all it, things Scandinavian. It, is I it, love all things Scandinavian. Is, is it your point that you would lose respect in the Nobel Committee if they awarded you the prize? I would think it was a very generous mistake, but I would accept it greedily. <laughs> <laughs> what are you at work on now, uh, uh, Mr. Borges? Well, precisely, I'm working on a book with a friend of mine, Maria Kodama, on Snorri Sturlason, the, the Icelandic historian. And then I'm also writing a book of poems to be published by MSA in Buenos Aires. And then a book of short stories to be published by MSA in Buenos Aires. And I'm, I'm writing off and on all the time, since I have nothing else to do. I live by myself. Well, now you, you, you say that you dislike your work. Do you also I dislike like working? It. No. I enjoy working, but I don't like the work. You know what Carlyle said? Carlyle said that all work is contemptible. But that doing that work is not content to it. may be the only justification for a man. And I think he was right. Because after all, when I'm working and fulfilling my, my destiny, what else can I do but work? What else can a blind man do but work? But, but as a result of the work, I leave that to others. I, I, I never read really what I have written, except when I have to go to, well, to correct the proof sheets. But I enjoy working. And not only working, but I enjoy planning my work. Perhaps more than the actual writing of it or the dictating of it, since writing, of course, is, is, is forbidden to me, no? You, you, ha you, have, you have been compared to both uh, Milton and Homer. Well, yes, in, in the sense of being blind, blind yes. Uh, yes, yes. <laughs> but but uh, uh, if, well, in other senses, too, you've been compared well. to them. I know that you make it a practice not to read anything about yourself. No, I so only read one were... book, a book published by, by a Bolivian, mm -hmm. his name was Tamayo, and an Argentine writer, 
the Ruiz Diaz, that's the only book I've read about. And they tell me there are some 300 books well, being, and, uh, written about me. But I think the writer should, should choose a better subject. Well, in that case, I'm in a position to instruct you about yourself. Ah, well, I suppose you are. Uh, you've, been, you've been compared to both Milton uh, and, uh, uh, and Homer uh, in, uh, in, in terms of a, a highly illuminated internal vision. Is this um, a correct judgment, as far as you're concerned? Well, I do my best to think it a correct judgment. At least, I try to put up with blindness. Of course, when you're blind, time flows in a different way. It flows, let's say, down an easy slope. I have sometimes spent sleepless nights, night before last, for example, but I, but I, didn't, feel, I didn't feel especially unhappy about it. Because time was, well, sliding down that, was, was flowing down that, that easy slope. You mean you'd have felt, you'd have felt l less, more unhappy if you had been able to see? Oh, yes, of course I Why? would. Why? Well, I can't very well explain it. These are a sort of years. When I first went blind, I mean for reading purposes, I felt very unhappy. But now I feel that being blind is, let's say, is part of my world. I suppose that that happens to, well, to everybody. When one's in jail, one thinks of being in jail as, as being a part of one's world. Or when one's sick also, after all. Huh? Well, in, how, how, do you, how, do you, how do you refresh yourself as, as someone who is blind well, I'm rereading. I'm rereading all the time, having books reread to I me. See. I do very little contemporary reading, but I'm always going back to certain writers. And among those writers, I would like to mention an American writer. I would like to mention Emerson. I think of Emerson. He's not only a great prose writer. Everybody knows that. A very fine intellectual poet. But that's the only intellectual poet who, 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 who had any ideas. No. <laughs> Emerson was brimming over with ideas. Well, you, you, you did a great deal to uh, re, sort of reintroduce uh, Americans to many American writers, including Emerson, isn't that correct? Yes, yes, I've done my best. Now, what, what is it that Emerson you... and also, well, another writer I greatly love. Hawthorne. Well, but in Hawthorne, what I dislike about Hawthorne is it's all writing fables. Well, in the case of Poe, well, you get tales, but, but, but well, it, it, there was no moral tagged on to them, no. Well, in the case of Hawthorne, things are always being, it becoming lessons or parables. But I would think of Melville, one of the great writers of the world, no? How, how do you account for the failure of Melville to achieve any recognition during his lifetime, any significant recognition? Because people thought of him as writing travel books. I have a... I have the 1911 edition of the Encyclopedia Britannica. There's an article about Melville, and they speak of him much in the same way as they might speak about Captain Marriott, for example, or other writers. I, I think that if he wrote many, many of his travel books, people thought of him writing in that way. So they couldn't see all that, uh, that is the Moby Dick or the White Whale meant. Did, what part did you play in the rediscovery of Melville? Well, in this country, I have done what I could, I suppose. Had it already been translated when you were a student? No, when I was a student, no, it hadn't been translated. It had been translated afterwards. And I translated a very fine story of Melville's. You know it, of course, it's about to be. Yes. You, you translated that for the first time? Yes, for the first time. Then I also think we did the first translation of uh, Hawthorne's It's a Wakefield, mm -hmm. a very fine story. After the manner of Kaffa, or rather Kaffa came after him, no? But, but Kafka enabled us to read Hawthorne better, which is what a great writer does. In a sense, he creates his, his the forerunners. It makes people read them in a different way. So maybe I shouldn't have read, I shouldn't have read Hawthorne's Wakefield as well as I did, or as I should have done, had I not read Kafka before. I think that's one of the functions, one of the gifts of a great writer, is to make people read in a different way, go over the old text in a different fashion. So, to, so the past is being continued, or is being continued, or is modified, no? Yes, yes. 
Well, now, you say, that, you say that you spend most of your time reading uh, the older writers now. Is it because you reject the newer writers or because you choose to continue to be unfamiliar with them? Because I'm afraid that I'll find the new writers more or less like myself. <laughs> I'm afraid of you won't. <laughs> well, I suppose, I suppose I will. I suppose all contemporaries are more or less alike, no? The scientists, the scientists like what I write. I prefer going back to the 19th to the 18th century. And then, of course, also going back to the, going back to the, to, to the Romans, since I have no Greek, but I had Latin. Of course, my Latin is very rusty, but still, as I once wrote, the fact that I've forgotten Latin is already, is, is, is in itself a gift. Yes. To have known Latin and forgotten it is something that, that, that sticks to you somehow. And it has to but you. But I have done most of my reading in English. I read very little in Spanish. Because my, I, I was educated practically in my father's library. And that was compounded of English books. So when I think of the Bible, I think of the King James Bible. When I think of the Arabian Nights, I think of Lane translation or of Captain Bolton's translation. When I think, of course, of Persian literature, I think in terms of Brown's literary history of Persia and, of course, of his generals. And, in fact, I, I, I remember the first book I read on the history of South America was Prescott's Conquest of Peru. Is that right? Yes, and then, and, and then I fell back on Spanish writers. But I have done most of my reading in English. I find English far finer language than, 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 than Spanish. Why? Well, there are many reasons. Firstly, in, uh, if, if, firstly, English is both a Germanic and a Latin language. You have those two registers. For example, for any idea you take, you have two words. Those words do not mean exactly the same. For example, if I say regal, they're not exactly the same thing as saying, uh, saying kingly. Or if I say fraternal, not the same as uh, saying the brotherly. Or dark and obscure. Those, those words are different. It would make all the difference, speaking, for example, of the Holy Spirit. It would make all the difference in the world in a poem if I wrote about the Holy Spirit and not about the Holy Ghost. Since ghost is a fine, dark Saxon word, while spirit is a light, it's a Latin word. Well, and then there is another reason. The reason is that I think that of all, of all languages, English is the, is the most physical of all languages. The most what? Physical. Mm -hmm. For example, you can't, for example, he loomed over. You can't very well say that in Spanish. Asomo? Well, no, but, no, but, no, but not exactly the same. And then you have, then in English, you can do, well, you can do en almost anything with verbs and prepositions. For example, to laugh off, to dream away. Those things can't be said in Spanish. To live down something, to live up to something. You can't say those things in Spanish. They can't be said, or in any, or in the Romance language. I suppose it can be said in German. But my German isn't, really, isn't too good. I, I, I taught myself German for the sake of reading Schopenhauer in the text. That was way back in 19, 1916. I had read Schopenhauer in English. I was greatly attracted to Schopenhauer, and then I thought, uh, I'll try to read him in the text. And then I taught myself German, and then, and then at long last I read Die Welt als Will und Vorstellung right. in the text. I mean, Paragon, Paralipomen also. Well, do you write your poetry in English or no. in Spanish? No, I respect English too much. I write it in Spanish. <laughs> well, do you, do you pass on the translations? Do you personally pass on the translations, or do you simply entrust well, them to well, people like Kerrigan? No, I have or people like, like, like uh, Alistair Reed, the Giovanni and Kerrigan, who greatly bettered my texts. Mm -hmm. you know, greatly bettered them. Mm -hmm. in, in, in a translation. And then, of course, in, in, in Spanish, words are far too cumbersome, they're far too long. Well, to go back to one of my hobbies. For example, if you take an English adverb, or two English adverbs, you say, you say, for example, quickly, slowly, and then the stress falls on the significant part of the word, quickly, slowly. Well, if you say it in Spanish, you say lentamente, Rapidamente, and then the stress falls, let's say, on the non significant part, on the gadget, right, as we call it, right, no? Right. Mm. And all that makes for a very cumbersome language. Yes. But still, Spanish is, is, is my destiny, it's my fate, and I have to do what I can with Spanish. Yeah? Well, do, do, does the fact that the Spanish language is less resourceful than the English language necessarily make it less complete as poetry? No, I think that when poetry is achieved, yeah. it can be achieved in any language. Mm -hmm. 
And that's a suppose a fine Spanish verse. Well, could hardly be translated into another language. Or at least, uh, well, maybe turn to something else. But, but when, when beauty happens, well, there it is, no? Yes. You know what Whistler said? People were discussing art in Paris. People spoke about, well, the influence of heredity, tradition, environment, and so on. And then Whistler said in his lazy way, art happens. Or, or it happens. Yeah. Art happens. Yeah. That, that's true. And I should say that beauty happens. And besides, I think that beauty is not, it's not something real. I think beauty is happening all the time. Art is happening all the time. In a chance conversation, a man may say a very fine thing, not being aware of it. I'm hearing, I'm hearing fine sentences all the time, from the man in the street, for example, from so, anybody. So you consider yourself a transcriber, to a certain extent? Yes, in a sense, I do. And I think that that I have written some fine lines, because everybody has written some fine lines. Mm -hmm. <laughs> That's not my privilege. <laughs> you writers are bound to write something, something fine, at least now and then, or off and on. Even Longfellow? Longfellow has some very beautiful lines, and very old-fashioned, but I like. This is a forest primeval, the murmuring pines and the hemlock. Those, that, that's a very fine line. Yes, uh, yes, yes. I don't know how people look down on Longfellow. Maybe he was, he was too much of a literary man, no? He was very much the same kind of, 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 of poet as, as uh, Ezra Pound, no? I mean, he's, he's, he, he, he took most things from his books and not from, from, from his own experience. But well, his translation of the Divine Common is a very fine translation. In fact, I read it in English or read it in Italian. <laughs> you did? Uh, whose translation? Longfellow's translation. Oh, I see. Yes. And I began because I've always been a bit of a prig by reading firstly the notes and then the text. Mm -hmm. The first thing I read were the notes as a boy. And then I went on to the text. And then, and then I took up the text. That must have been, oh, some, well, 30 years ago. And then I found out that I had no necessity of knowing Italian. But if I had Spanish, I had Italian, and that Italian could be, and that the Divine Comedy could be read with anybody with, who, who heard Spanish. So that's all the languages are much the same. And the Italian editions of, of the of the, of the Comedy are very fine. For example, Timomiliano, for example, or uh, or Greba, or or, or Tigrabher. There's a note to almost every line. So if you don't understand the verse itself, you don't know fall back on the notes. That's very interesting. I think I've, I have read the, the Divine Comedy some uh, 11 or 12 times over, and I, and I have no Italian. I couldn't, I couldn't talk to an Italian or, 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 or to see an Italian film or hear an Italian film. I couldn't understand it. And I have no Italian blood. But somehow Italian and Spanish, well, they're, they're, they're so alike. Well, would you understand it if it were read to you? I don't think so. Mm -hmm. If it were read to me, it might be read too quickly. Yes, yes. But if I don't understand a line in Italian, then of course I can reread it. Yes. These, these, these thoughts that go through your mind that you transcribe, uh, as you put it, into uh, prose and, and poetry. I wonder if there's an essential difference. I don't think so. Eh? I think the gist is the same, no? I mean, when an idea comes to me, I don't know whether it will become a tale It'll become a short story, or a sonnet, or maybe an example of free verse. That comes afterwards. First, I see the whole thing from afar. And then somehow, it has to be licked into shape. <laughs> now, this, this, this was as much true be when you could see as, as oh, yes. since? Always, yes. The technique was always the same. The technique is always the same. The technique is the technique of being, let's say, an onlooker, of, of seeing things but seeing them at first in a very misty way. And then afterwards, while getting nearer them, seeing them closer. But in the case of a story, in the case of a story, or even in the case of a poem, I always know the beginning and the end. Generally, I know the first line and the last line, or at least the, the, what would happen. But then I have to find out what happens in between. No? And then, of course, I have to grow up and maybe go and, and lose my way and maybe go back. Oh, you do have to struggle in between, do you? Of course I do. But that's, the struggle that's, is that's part of the game. Me, that's not merely an act of transcription. No, it, no, it isn't. But the struggle, but the struggle makes for, 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 for enjoyment. But do you, know, do you know at the outset that you're going to succeed if you know the first and last lines? Yes, I know. 
But I wonder if I have, if I have succeeded. <laughs> People say I have now and then. I think there's a lot of agreement on that point. Well, but, uh, yes, I but don't believe in democracy, so I believe in a lot of agreement. No. <laughs> it's all those of mere statistics. <laughs> But is, 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 it, uh, is, it, is there a critical democracy in which you do believe, or do you find that the opinion of the critics is often mistaken so that very little well, expertise critic, lies in the field? Having been a critic, I know that their opinions are generally mistaken. In fact, I have been mistaken many times over. Can you give an example of someone uh, uh, whose reputation was for years mistaken? Is Melville a good example? Melville might be. Mm -hmm. But Melville now, I think holds his own, no? Yes. I mean, he should. Yes. They're not in all his books. I is there a living writer who, uh, who is vastly underappreciated? I know very little about living writers. In my case, I, s I could say that I'm overrated. <laughs> <laughs> greatly overrated. My, my stuff is greatly overrated. Well, what about Neruda? Neruda, when he was a sentimental poet, he was quite bad. When he was a communist, he wrote very fine poetry. That means that communism was the kind of food he needed, no? Even as Walt Whitman needed the, 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 the democracy, no? But I think Neruda is a fine poet. In fact, I was in Stockholm when we were going to, once upon a time, a fair, and then I said that, that if, uh, this was more or less on the eve of the, of the judgment, no? Yes. Then I said, well, if they choose me, they're making a mistake. Of course, I'll grab <laughs> the prize if I can. But I think there are two candidates. Those two candidates would be Pablo Neruda and, and Jorge Eugen, at least in the Spanish language. Yeah. What about uh, Gabriel Marquez? Gabriel Marquez, I think he wrote the one book. The book, I, I, think, I, I think the book, it falls off, no? I think it begins well, but then at the end, the writer is a style of the reader, perhaps, no? <laughs> What about but the professor? I know very little about him. Mm -hmm. I was, a, I was a editing a literary magazine when a young man came, came up to see me. He brought a manuscript. Then he came back within 10 days. Then I told him the story was going to be published. But I said it was going to illustrate it. That story was La Casa Tomada by, by Julio Cortázar. Mm -hmm. Then I met him in Paris and he reminded me of the incense. But I haven't read his other books. Mm -hmm. That story is a very fine story. After the manner, Let's see, after the manner of perhaps Arthur Mackin, or, yes, I should say so. Are there, are there any of these uh, writers, um, Mr. Borges, whose work simply resists Spanish translation into Spanish? Nabokov, for instance? I wonder if he has been translated. I, was, I don't know. I don't think so, eh? Well, then he does resist, I guess. Well, in the case of Joyce, of course, well, he can't be translated. I don't think James Joyce could be translated, unless he invented. No, but, but of course, in the case of James Joyce, I mean, his craft is out of the language. I mean, that kind of thing can't be translated. I mean, write, for example, the rivering waters of, the hither and thithering waters of night. How can you translate that? How can you translate rivering waters of? It's like translating Lewis Carroll. Well, it can't be done. No. It hasn't been done, it hasn't been done in German because German is more or less akin to English, but not in Spanish. In Spanish, the whole thing is rather plain, you know? Is Shakespeare successfully translated into Spanish? No. Because Shakespeare also, I mean, he abounds in verbal music, in world craft. That kind of thing can't be translated. I attempted, I, I attempted a translation of Macbeth. And then after a scene or two, I, I felt I couldn't do it. And they left it. Because Macbeth would be my, my favorite. The, the Shakespearean tragedy. I mean, it's so tense. It begins at full speed and then goes on until the end, no? Yeah. Yeah, right, right. Are, are you one of the last admirers of Kipling? I hope, I, I, I hope I'm not one of the last. I think Kipling was a very great man. I know you do. I, I, but I, but I, he's, he's not very widely appreciated no, or no, even read, is he? No, because he's judged by his political opinions. And suppose opinions are on the surface. I don't think a writer should be judged by his opinions. I think when you write, you should be judged, well, by, by what you write. And you don't write with your opinions. Opinions, after all, are on the surface. They come and go. People hold many different opinions during their lifetime. But in the case of Kipling, he was a very wise man also. And his world craft is wonderful. When I remember, for example, harp song of the Dane women. You see how stark 
the title of the poem is. How, how, it doesn't even sound like English. It might be Old English or, or Old Norse. Harp song of the Dane women. And then sick and again for the shouts and the slaughter. There you get the Old English staff rhyme or alliteration. Sick and again for the shouts and the slaughter. Yes, yes, yes. No, he's a very fine writer. Is he, was he appreciated in your childhood in Spanish or not? Yes, he was. He was. But people think of him, I think, if a writer writes for children, he makes a mistake. I mean, as concerns his own fame. Because people think of him as writing only, as only writing for children. In the case of Stevenson, for example. Why do people look down on Stevenson? Because they think only of Treasure Island. A very fine book, but the book meant for boys. But had they really saw the book, they would, they would feel that he was a very fine writer also. So perhaps it may be a mistake for a writer to attempt to attempt, uh, let's say, the boyish fiction or to attempt uh, the detective fiction, because people think of him in terms of, of, of that particular kind of craft. Is it? I suppose in the case of Chesterton, people who know he's a very fine writer, but if people think of the Far Brown stories, then they are apt to class him with, well, with Ellery Queen or with, uh, or with uh, even Philpott or with any other writer. Agatha Christie is not Or Agatha Christie, yes, yeah. but of course he was a so well, is, is, is it a mistake? Is it, is it a mistake? It's it a mistake for the fame of a writer, not for a writer himself. Sure. Because after all, I, I would, I would, well, if the Far Brown story didn't exist, I would feel it was a great loss. Mm -hmm. This to me. I agree. But at the same time, it has done him no good as uh, it has done no good to to, to his uh, to reputation. Well, is it? Uh, would you go so far as to say that a writer who seeks fame ought not to read books that children can enjoyably read? No, 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 no. What about Tolkien, for instance? No. Well, Tolkien, I have found him, I have only found him out of board, I have never got inside his books. I have, when who got inside his books? I have never got inside his books. Mm -hmm. I've always been an outsider, no? Yes. I attempted the Brotherhood, is it the Brotherhood of the Rings? Yes, the, the, yeah, the Lordship of the Rings, isn't it? The Lordship of the Rings, I don't know, but in any case, no rings were awarded me, no. I tried to enjoy him, I did my best. I was in Scotland at the time, there were two young Americans there who, who read him, laughed very loudly, but at the same time I felt that I got nothing out of the reading. When, when he was, when they, when they, when they him to, to Lewis Carroll, thought that was sheer the blasphemy, no. I'm so fond of Lewis Carroll. No, no what I said was the writer should not know, not read, but not write. Of children, because that, that may have a reputation. Yeah. But after all, I wonder if reputations are, are worthwhile. Yeah. Well, the problem is the work itself. The, I mean, the enjoyment of, the, of, of what you're doing. I only think of, of reading and of writing in terms of happiness. If you don't feel happy when you're reading or when you're writing, then, or if you don't feel greatly moved, then then you're not really reading or writing. The whole thing is merely reading, I mean, for, for, for examination marks and that, that of course, I won't say that way madness lies, but that way dullness lies. Or are you really saying that all, all writers should enjoy, are you saying that writers should enjoy writing? Well, of course they should. At least I do. <clears throat> I mean, I have, to, I, have, I have to toil, I have to work, but at the same time I'm enjoying it. And after all, I mean, it's, uh, I could have chosen that, that, that uh, literary fate for myself. Would well, you think a gymnast should enjoy? I know nothing whatever about gymnasts. <laughs> so whatever I say. <laughs> well, ought, ought, they to, ought, ought, ought they to enjoy their exercises? Would you say? Are, are, are you making a universal statement that no, all I'm people not. should enjoy their work? No, I, I suppose sweeping what? statements should be avoided, and that's a sweeping statement also. No, <laughs> maybe. A, <laughs> When one talks and falls into sweeping statements, no. In fact, if you talk, you are making a sweeping statement. Eh? If you say A is B, that's a sweeping statement. It may not be always B, there is something else. But I enjoy writing. In fact, one of the few enjoyments left. Uh, uh, so, as, as you put it, you would write even if you were Robinson Crusoe, and there was no, no Well, Robinson Crusoe, the only thing I could do was to, would be to write. <laughs> Yeah, you can build canoes. Well, my canoes would be hardly worth the building. Eh? <laughs> I don't think I'm any good at that you, kind you, of craft you, or any other. You'd rather write a book about how to build a canoe than build a canoe, right? Oh, yes, of course I would. <laughs> <laughs> well, well, maybe I would choose another subject, no. <laughs> well, what, what um, in your judgment, uh, 
is, is the new Philistinism about which there is a lot of talk these days. Uh, I don't know. Uh, there, there are so many Philistines in the world. Which, which is the one to which you have a special allergy? I hate nationalism. I As distinguished from patriotism? Yes, I think nationalism is a mistake. And I think that we're all more or less nationalistic. Maybe I am. When you say Argentina, I was very angry. There was no such word. The world should be Argentine. Argentina is an invention. I mean, the rhyme, the word that rhymes to Bolivian or Peru. There's no such word, of course. Since Argentine is an adjective. <laughs> uh, Argentine is an adjective? Of course, the Argentine Republic. Because Argentine is Silvern because of the Rio de la Plata. Or mm -hmm. Silver River. Silver River, yes. Argentina is no such word. That was. That, 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 oh, are you talking in English, you mean? No, I don't think there's any such word. In Spanish there's no such word. You never say Republic Argentiniana, you say Republic Argentina. Mm -hmm. Nobody, if you say Argentina, people would stare at you. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That, that's, uh, how common is that error? Yes, I was asked all the time when I was in, when I was in the state, people asked me, are you an Argentina? And I said, no, there's no such thing. Are you Spaniard? Well, I left off being a Spaniard 150 years ago. I was a Latin American. Well, no. Who knows what a Latin America is? There's no, such, there's no such thing. I mean, a man is a Colombian, a Peruvian, a Bolivian, an Uruguayan, but hardly a Latin American. There's no such thing. Or an Argentine. Or an Argentine. Why not? <laughs> I and do my best to be good Argentine. And you say you, you, de you detect this nationalism even in yourself? Do you detect a lot of it in, in current literature? I detect it in myself. You do? I don't know why, for example, I write so much about such a, well, such an invisible, such a dull city of Buenos Aires, and yet I love it. Mm -hmm. I write so much about myself, I'm not an interesting character, and yet I keep, keep on being interested in Jorge Luis Borges, I don't know why. Well, one <laughs> Still, of it's the, a lifelong habit. <laughs> one of the books about you says that uh, your most intense experiences are autobiographical, but that doesn't mean I either, either that you're narcissistic or that you're nationalistic, does it? I don't think so. I suppose it means, it means more essential things. It means, well, it might mean thinking or loving or falling in love or being crossed in love or being now and then happy in love. Those things are essential to a man. But they're universals too. They are universals, of course. So, so therefore, you're not Happily. you're not committing the sin of nationalism. No, no, I'm not. Or of narcissism. No, no, I'm not. Yeah. Writing no, I don't think I'm a, I'm a narcissist or a nationalist for that matter. But the nationalism, <coughs> I think, is wrong in all countries, especially in a new country like like the mine. I mean, you can you can imagine, for example, well, let's say if you're a Chinaman or if you're a Japanese or or even or a European or even if you're an American, you might be a nationalist. But here, where history is, well, let's say, some hundreds and odd years old. I mean, there's a, a country with no local color like this. We only have, well, we had quite a fine history in the last century. And now I think that we're, that we're more or less improving. I mean, I mean we went through, through a very sad period, but now things are better. <laughs> or at least we should hope they are better, because our hope is part of the, of the bettering, no? Yes. Well, it didn't undermine your appreciation of Kipling, his nationalism. No, because I think the British Empire made for good. I think you're right there. So, so maybe it's it did bad no good to England. Be attractive, not just yeah. nationalism. But in the case of Kipling, <clears throat> I think I not only think the British Empire made for good, but but I think that 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 that, that Kipling needed that faith in order to write his books. Even as a full river needed democracy, or Neruda to communism, or, or, or Dante needed uh, the Roman Catholic Church. That it was a catalyst of his talent? Yes, he was. Mm -hmm. but, but, but why not? That's, that, that's allowable. Not only allowable, it was good, it we wished for. Well, why don't we have uh, any good literature coming out of the Soviet Union celebrating communism? Why isn't it a catalyst of anything beautiful? Because people are bullied into it. <laughs> uh, you, as, as distinct from Neruda, who was not? No, he was not. Now, to the sincerity of Neruda, I know nothing, whatever. But still, it made him, I mean, he was a bad sentimental poetry. His love poetry was quite bad. 
uh, he, 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 he thought so too. And then, then that political faith came to him and saved him. I only met Neruda once in my life. He thought of nothing would be done with the Spanish language. And then I said to him, something might be done with English. And then he said, well, something has been done. And then I said, Spanish, nothing has been done as yet. And I said, no, I suppose not. And I said, well, we'll have to do something <laughs> for <the> God forsaken <laughs> language. And well, we did, well, at least he did. <clears throat> How many books ago was that conversation? Yeah. That must have been way back in 1920-odd, eh? He was already a communist, was he? I don't know, because he never spoke about politics. Mm -hmm. But he loved the English language. I suppose he always did. Well, you say, you say that uh, if you're bullied, then you, you, sti you stifle the muse? I think you do, eh? Well, but you stifle Dan everything. Dante was bullied. I don't think he was bullied. I, I, no, I don't think he was bullied. I think he, 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 he believed in it. But he lived, he, li he lived in an age in which it was dangerous not to believe, didn't he? Well, I suppose he was intensely religious. For example, I can't think of myself as being a Roman Catholic or even a Christian. They just think I thoroughly enjoy the, the Divine Comedy without enjoying the, like, the framework, of course. I don't, I, I don't like the framework. The idea, I mean, of three institutions of hell, purgatory, and heaven, and paradise. I can't believe in that kind of thing. But still, if I accept that framework, then I have a wonderful poem, perhaps the greatest poem ever written. It's it given me. Mm -hmm. But the, uh, why, why, why is it that the, there is no intense love of communism that brings, that has brought out uh, an, an equivalent mm -hmm. masterwork? Of course, I suppose you can't have an equivalent masterwork, but a masterwork. Well, why, how do you account for the aridity of the entire Soviet experience in the last uh, 50 years, 60 years? What do you think aridity has to be explained away? I think it's quite common. For example, let's well, say, it, uh, well, maybe I'm hurting people by saying this. If you take the United States, you have at least half a dozen men of genius. I mean, from a political in, in point of view. You mean in 200 years? Well, well, you have, for example, you have Paul, you have Melville, you have Whitman, you have Hawthorne, you have Henry James. Well, and you have Frost. What? Well, well, Pound. I, well, Pound, well, I don't want to rope him in, but if you do, yeah. <laughs> It's not my funeral one. Well. <laughs> but at the same time, if you think of Canada and Australia, they have produced nothing, produced practically nothing. So maybe the American Revolution made for good from a literary point of view. Uh, in, in other words, you, 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 you consider six people in 200 years a profusion of genius and well, aridity the rule of thumb. Yes, I should say so. But, but well, sure. what I mean to say is that well, you may like or dislike Poe. I don't think much of him as a poet. But I think of him as being a man of genius. Mm -hmm. You may like or dislike Whitman. You can find quite bad lines in him. But he can't be thought away. You can't think of contemporary literature and... Uh, and, 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 and dismiss and, Whitman. Uh, yes, and dismiss them. They can't be thought away. Right. While other writers may be thought away. <coughs> For example, it's, it's South America has produced nobody worthwhile, I mean, to the whole world. I mean, I suppose we have some fine writers. They're fine writers, let's say, for Argentines, or for Chileans, or for Peruans, but, and so on. But, but they mean nothing whatever to the world. Well, you do. Neruda well, did. That's, that's Neruda did. Well, in my case, I think that what you're saying is a form of pessimism, eh? say that <laughs> <laughs> or of optimism. I, I, I gather that you're telling me that there's no reason to expect that in no. Russia there should be a huge figure. Of course there is, and that's Solzhenitsyn, and he's a dissenter. But do you, do you expect anything from Australia, for example? I don't suppose you do. Patrick White. Well, I don't know him. Sorry to say. He must plead my ignorance. He won a Nobel Prize, I believe, didn't he? Well, if that means anything. No. Of no. <laughs> <laughs> course, <necessarily mean> <laughs> well, I shouldn't say that, not I, having won it, no. I think he... Well, maybe they needed an Australian, no, they needed a kangaroo and so they... <laughs> well, well you, ha you have then no thesis that would explain why over a period of 50 years in Russia there was the biggest uh, spiritual conflagration <coughs> in, literary, in literary history and then nothing. You might say that, uh, that in that case the, the Tsarism was better. 
Es decir, que hay Tolstoy, en Dostoyevsky, en Google. Yeah. <laughs> they, they, they made for good. Correct, they, but, but what, what was it that all of a sudden brought that whole movement, destroyed the inertia? Or is, is, is it simply, uh, is genius too rare to make it possible to formulate any rules about the incidence of it? Suppose, suppose it is rare, and then we have to fall back on Whistler, or it happens, or it doesn't. <laughs> Nothing unexpected. But there are propitious and non-propitious circumstances, aren't there? And propitious countries also. For example, England. I greatly love England. I worship England. Yet England, for example, if you think of it in terms of music or of painting, it's not a very important country. Yeah. But in terms of literature, it is. In terms of poetry, especially. In terms of prose, also. Mm -hmm. But I don't suppose England has produced any musicians important to the that matter to, to, to the whole world. I don't suppose they have. Though I love Turner, but still that may be a private bias or hobby of mine only. You love who? Turner. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, well, and Blake also. Well, of course, in Blake, what I admire is rather the, well, the poet and the mystic. Yeah. Well, are, are, you, are you making really a genetic observation or a cultural observation that the people with English blood will gravitate to, to letters, but not so much to art or music? I suppose you might be translating to that, but I won't care to make such a sweeping statement. Mm -hmm. In fact, I wonder if I'm capable of abstract thinking. I don't think I am. Eh? I only think in terms of particulars, of individuals. That may be my English side also, no? Yes. So things in terms of, I mean, phenomenalism of individuals. In, in France, would you make any generalities of the English nature? France has produced many men of genius. Mm -hmm. I think we should all feel very grateful to France. Be, I think we have been ungrateful to France because always looking at England and also at the Scandinavian countries. Mm -hmm. But no, but, 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 but France can't be thought away. It can't be done. Spain has produced perhaps the one man of genius, Cervantes. And the others, I suppose, may be safely forgotten. Mm -hmm. At least I safely, or unsafely forget them, no? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I, have, I have a Spanish, Portuguese, and English blood. And maybe, as everybody has, it's a Jewish blood also, no? <laughs> Is, have, the, have the Portuguese uh, produced uh, a, a writer of the first rank yes, by I yours have, rather severe I, standards? I think they've produced two. Isa de Queiroz, the 19th century novelist, and Camões, who wrote the one, the great epic poem, The Luciates where you, you have a feeling for the sea. You never get that in Spanish poetry. We have no, we have no feeling whatever for the sea. Why? Well, the, 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 the Castilian were an inland people, no? That may that explain the failure of the Armada also, no? <laughs> They're not at home. <laughs> <clears throat> On the sea. Well, uh, is, is, it, uh, uh, is it in your experience possible to stimulate a love of literature, or is it something that also just happens or doesn't happen? Is it possible to take well, 20 course, people and make Of course, I've been a, professor, I've been a professor of English and American literature during some 20 years, the University of Buenos Aires. That's why I asked Then you. I have tried to teach my students not literature, that can be told, but the love of literature. And I have sometimes, I sometimes succeeded and failed many times over, of course. But Still, the whole thing I've done in four months, I'll do very little. But still, I know there are many young men in Buenos Aires. Maybe they're not so young now. But young men and young women who have their who have their, their memories full of English words. <laughs> and I have, I have I have been studying Old English and Old Norse for the last 20 years. And I have also taught taught many people the love of, of Old English. And, uh, and that, so there is a, a pedagogical art. It isn't simply a matter of, uh, of, of, uh, but I think, of, but, of, but, 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 but I think literature is being taught in the wrong way all the time. It's being taught in terms of history and sociology. And I wouldn't do that. I mean, I have seen many teachers who are always falling back on dates, on uh, place names. You don't do that? I do my best to avoid it. Mm -hmm. the whole on the grounds that it's distracting? Yes, of course. Uh, yes, yes, I say that's artificially relevant, you know? Mm -hmm. if I, for example, if, if I give you a beautiful line of verse, 
that verse is, it should be beautiful today as it was what centuries ago or had it written today should be it should be beautiful also well doesn't the, doesn't the context in which you read it attach a certain meaning to it Yes, but I suppose if a line is beautiful, the context can be safely forgotten, no? If I say, for example, that the moon is the mirror of time, that's a fine metaphor. Because you think yeah. of a mirror, you think something round, it can be easily broken, and yet somehow the moon is as old as time, or half as old as time. Now, what I to add, that comes from a Persian poet, I wonder if that would add to the beauty. Perhaps he might add in a certain way. But still, had that metaphor been, in, been, uh, been invented this morning, it would be a fine metaphor, no? The moon, the mirror of time. But it happens to be a Persian metaphor. Well, but cer certainly certain things are accepted as beautiful, in part depending on the prevailing style. <coughs> the kind of enthusiasm, for instance, that was shown <coughs> for Restoration Comedy. Uh, <coughs> it, some yeah. of that stuff isn't very funny now. Some of the romantic excesses but, but of the 19th century are... Yeah, but I suppose that all that's rather... That's rather artificial, no? That's one of the reasons why I'm so fond of old English poetry, that nobody knows nothing whatever about the poets, about the precise, let's say, century they wrote in. And yet I find something very stirring about old English poetry. Maybe. It has to stand on its own two feet, you mean? I think it, it has to. Or maybe because I like the sounds of it. Meich bamas hyl bum soth yadur rekan, sitha sejan. Now, those words sound, those sounds have, have a ring to them, no? What does that say in, in, what is that in, that in that, dollars? That would say, wait a bit. In dollars that would be, I can utter a true song about myself. I can tell my travels. That sounds like Walt Whitman, no? Yes. yes. That was written in the ninth century in Northumberland. May ich be my sylvum soth yedu rekan, sitha sedja. And this Rapon translated it as this. I think it's a rather crap translation. May I, for my own sake, songs truth reckon. Jargon is jargon. Well, that's too, too much of a jargon to me, no? Of course, it, 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 he's translating the sounds. May ich be my sylvum soth yedu rekan, sitha sedja. May I, for my sake, songs truth reckon, soth yedu rekan. He's translating sounds more of a sense, no? Yes. And then sitha sedja, well, tell my travel, he translates jargon is jargon, which is rather uncouth, at least to me, no? <coughs> Whose translation do you say? Uh, it's a pound's translation. Oh, oh, it is? I it's a pound's translation from the Anglo Saxon, yes. How would you have translated that word? I would translate it literally. I can utter. I can say a true song about myself. I can tell my travels. I think that should be enough, no? It was a plain statement, mm -hmm. uh, uh, a straightforward statement. Mm -hmm. But in any case, this would be an example of something that, uh, th th that can't be influenced by change in fashion. I don't think so. It's beautiful then and now. I think now. these things are beautiful. Well, Keats said it, he said it in too far away, perhaps, but I think it was true. A thing of beauty is a joy forever. <laughs> Mm -hmm. I suppose he meant that, no? If he meant anything. <laughs> now, when you say too flowery a way, you, you were intending what kind of criticism? Well, a thing one, of one beauty is a joy forever. There is something flowery about it. Don't you think so? Well, I, I do, but, but I'm not sure that, that the, the perspective by which we are permitted that observation was available to him. Yeah, but if you have to take perspective into account, then things are not too, too good, no? For example, I was reading Burton's translation of the Arabian Nights. I think Arabian Nights is a very fine work. Fine has been written to the, to, to this morning. It's a very fine work. And uh, and would read well I think any would, time. I think it would. Mm -hmm. I think th that's the, the test that the book that the book should read well at any time. Of course, when writers go in for world craft, for verbal, for world music. Then, of course, it's very difficult to, 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 to translate them. In the case of Shakespeare, for example, I suppose that half the beauty lies in the language. And then, then, of course, it can't be translated. Well, is, is there a correlation between the self-esteem of a writer and his permanence? Or is there no rule on the subject? Do some modest writers live and some vain writers die? 
I don't think I could say anything valuable for, on that on that subject. Eh? Did Dante know he had written a masterpiece? <clears throat> yes, he was full, fully aware of it. You can see that he, he knew very well what he was doing. Unlike Shakespeare, unlike Shakespeare, was, was unconscious of what he was doing. Well, let's take a lesser example. Did Mark Twain know how good a book he was writing when he wrote it? Huck Finn? I don't think so. No. You see, at the end of the book falls to pieces. Tom Sawyer is allowed to, to spoil the book. Eh? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, yet, and yet he wrote the book. The one book, I should say. Well, the other books are some, some are quite good, no? I mean, uh, well, Roughing It, Life on the Mississippi, <coughs> First Days in California. Those, those are fine books, but those are not all as good. Of course, he had to be making jokes all the time. That, I suppose, rather hampered him, no? Yeah. Yeah. Well, Cervantes thought of himself as a poet, didn't he, primarily? As a poet, he was nowhere. Yeah. So that was simply a mistaken judgment. No, what I mean to say, he was a poet when he was writing prose, no? Mm -hmm. when he was writing, when he was attempting verse. Yes, yes. Grusac said that the one good verse he had written in Spanish was La gracia que no supo darme el cielo. I mean, of being a poet, no? Yeah. That's the one line of good verse he ever wrote. Do you want to translate that? The gift that heaven did not give me, no? Could not give me. Could a, not give me. Yes, could not. Que no quiso, no, would not. Did not care to. Well, <clears throat> thank you uh, very much, Mr. Borges. I've no, I have to it. thank you for extraordinary patience, no? <laughs> You can have my patience any time you want. Well, thank you, sir. And thank you yeah. very much, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you, sir. For a printed, bound transcript of this program, send $1 to Firing Line, Post Office Box 5966, Columbia, South Carolina, 29250. That's Firing Line, Post Office Box 5966, Columbia, South Carolina, 29250. This program was produced by SICA, which is solely responsible for its content and was funded in part by public television stations. Thank you.